Okay, everybody, welcome back to Philosophy for the People. We're in philosophy class with the professor himself, Dr. Josh Rasmussen, is finally back on, on the show. Uh, Josh has, has been on the on the program many times. It's always it's always wonderful to see you, Josh. It's always wonderful to talk with you. And thanks for coming on again. Yeah, thank you. I just love that background. It's very inspiring to me. It makes me feel like right in the classroom. Right. I was telling Rachel, my wife, before this time together, just how much I love this. And especially just talking with you about these ideas that are so interesting. This is like one of my favorite things to do in life. Well, th well thank you. Yeah, I mean, that, that really means so a you. lot. Yeah. I mean, our conversations both on the podcast and just our private correspondence has been yeah. so enriching to me. Uh, so really, no, thank you. I mean, um, there's few people that I think I can say I've stolen as much of their work as I have from you. So, <laughs> Well, that's an honor. You know, when I see my work and, and what you do yeah. that I love is you take ideas and you integrate them into your own thinking. It, mm -hmm. I never feel like you're just kind of copying and pasting. Mm -hmm. It's always there's this chewing and a digesting of it. And then you have your own presentation mm -hmm. of it. So it, it, you wouldn't even necessarily recognize it. Although, I, I mean, I would see, you know, oh, that that looks that looks familiar. I like mm -hmm. that. That looks beautiful. Mm -hmm. But you made it beautiful because you've really digested it. And I, I think that's kind of rare that I see that that people would sort of really go deep, digest an idea, and then put it put it out into a new form for a particular audience that you have in mind. Well, thank you. That means that that, that really does does mean a lot. And I do try to do that. And one of the things I've loved about your work is is not to make this entirely just like the uh, mutual admiration society, but it is what it is, Sorry. right? <laughs> is, <laughs> is that you have such a unique angle of approach uh, especially, and we'll talk about cosmological reasoning here in a bit that I think really complements, um, call it the perennial tradition, but is genuinely unique at the same time. And I've always been kind of interesting in seeing, well, well, how does that link up? Like how does Josh's argument from limits link up to, uh, Thomas's understanding of yeah. potency as, as the bound or form of restriction on being. And I think that there's strong links there. I've always just been kind of interested in exploring that. Yeah. And maybe we can as we move along a little bit here. So just to set the stage a little bit, what prompted this conversation is um I think it was on Twitter or something. Um we both have books coming out. Josh's is much sooner than mine. Mine will be July. Yours is is it this month, Josh? Yeah, the... Mar March 20. Okay. We're gonna make yeah. sure that everyone has all the links and we're gonna talk about that book uh a lot and where and how to get it uh throughout this conversation, but especially at the end. And we wanted to just come on and kind of jam about some of the ideas uh, and no yeah. particular agenda. Um, you know, your book is Who Are You Really? Is that that's going to be that's the final title of it now. Yeah. Right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Rachel came up with that. She's it's like, great. who are you really? And I thought that that's great. The publisher liked it. So and the yeah. cover and the cover looks awesome. And it's an amazing book. I had the the the, the real honor of getting to look at an early draft. And I just saw the most recent iteration and. Uh, you added a lot and we were talking behind the scenes a little bit of uh, this is kind of a, a trap that sometimes you fall into. And, and I found this is not just true when it comes to philosophy, but my other books that I've written too in fitness is you just always keep wanting to add, add, add stuff. You always want to add. You never want to send it off to the publisher. Yeah. You're afraid you're going to forget something or you're going to look back five minutes later and say, oh, I should have said this or I should have said this other thing or I should have addressed that objection. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Yeah. Josh, do you have or, or, do you have a secret? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do I deal with that? Well, first, let me describe the problem a little more, yeah. as I can relate to this. It, it this book became an obsession, mm. uh, it, it, and, and it wasn't even just adding more. It was okay. How can I say that more clearly? How can I say yeah. that better? Mm -hmm. But it also was adding more. Friends kept sending me books, new books, like books that came out just like a month ago. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, oh, I got to read that. That's by a neuroscientist who does good work on that. So I read that book. And then, oh, okay, there's some things I want to adjust in my presentation based on this book that I just read. And so, yeah, it became an, a, an obsession. And I actually kind of like that, that it became. Now, this does not always happen with my project. Sometimes mm -hmm. I have an article, just get it done, send it off. They like it. They'll publish it. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to go on to the next thing. Because I always like the new. This is something that I, I just crave, like the new path, the new insight. I don't want to take so much time just working on the old. But with this book, I just, I really wanted it to be um, clear and deep at the same time. Yeah. And for for me, that was a big challenge on this topic, uh, the, the topic of the mind, our relationship to matter, material world. 
it, there's so much depth behind the scenes. A lot of stuff that's been developing through science and then through analysis, both science and analysis. And a lot of people just aren't aware of these developments. Mm. Um, but to get people to be aware of them requires technical precision. And it's hard to know how to, you know, how much depth to go into, how to describe it. And I just didn't want to hold anything back, Pat. I really wanted just to go as deep all the way down to the to the edges of the field and beyond and, and try to do this in, in a way um, that would be helpful. So how do I solve the problem of being obsessed? I don't really know if I have. <laughs> I just, I, you just don't do it. You just obsess, but, right? <laughs> but there is something. I, I, I don't know how to explain this or something yeah. in my intuition that kind of just tells me, okay, this piece it's is right. It's time. This piece, mm -hmm. this piece is right. Like I'll read it back. And I just feel proud of it. It's like mm. it's ready to go. Yeah, yeah, that's um, beautiful. Now, now, in this case, I was slowing down the publisher. Uh, even even the first prints, there there there, there are a few typos that kind of skated through. Mm. Those have been reported. Those will be cleaned up. Um, I was slowing them down because I was really trying to make sure that every part would be good. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, it is good, Josh. It's amazing. Yeah, I'm so excited to talk about some of the the content and share some of the ideas here. It's over. It's but it was over 300 pages, I think, the last count, right? Uh, it's big substantial. It's, it's, it's substantial. more intense. You know, the previous book people might remember me for is the, this bridge of reason, um, how reason can lead to God. I'm looking for it. That, usually that, that is a shorter book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I've got one somewhere around here too, but not in my visual field. Mm -hmm. But I talk about visual fields in the person's book. You know, this is one of my yeah. topics. What is it? And yeah, yeah I, I kind of surprised myself in a way, you know, when the book turned out, um, there's a little story at the end of each chapter to kind of keep the reader sort of interested in a um, kind of a long form thread. Yeah. Uh, like, what is this thing that we're discovering? And yeah, when it was completed, I realized, yeah, this is a bit more intense than the previous book. It's it's uh, there's more in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 great. So all right, let's start. Let's start exploring around then, because there's lots we can do here. I want to maybe start with. Well, really, we're, we're kind of the thing that I think is, has captured uh, our interest the most. Well, maybe not. I think I can say this to you. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Is just asking about questions of fundamentality. Yeah. Uh, whether there is some sort of fundamental part of reality. And if there is, then, then what is it like? And uh, there's lots of different approaches to this. And I think I wanted to explore this a bit with you and get some of your current thoughts on all of it. And in my book, which you haven't seen the the full iteration yet, but I've I've sent you some some snippets. I kind of I kind of take yeah. a page from your book where, and tell me if you think this is kind of a right um, way of looking at the landscape or approaches to God. But you kind of have what I might call the traditional approach, and the traditional approach is you send a metaphysician out into the field and they start carving reality at its joints, and they come up with certain principles mm. and categories, and they say, okay, to make sense of all these things, yeah, uh, you need this other thing is its necessary condition, right? And this yeah. other thing will have certain features or lacks of certain features, right? Yeah. And uh, through a process of thinking about that, you kind of come up with something that many people have argued is transcendent or divine, all right? Yeah. Uh, the other approach in contrast to that is, okay, let's just kind of craft a big picture hypothesis, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll this guy will craft one and he'll, he'll call it a God hypothesis and he'll kind of describe it in a certain way. And then somebody else will, will craft another hypothesis and maybe it'll be um, maybe physicalist or something, something like that, you know? Um, and then they'll say, okay, well, let's see which hypothesis makes better predictions. Yeah. Like that, right. Yeah. And then we'll kind of gain confirmation of one over the other. And maybe we'll arbitrarily restrict our space of hypotheses or try and find some way to divide it up that we're not just like completely lost or whatever. I don't know if you were ever explicit about this, Josh, but one thing I picked up in your work that I wanted to try to, to develop a little bit in my own book is that I thought we could use the first approach to form the hypothesis mm -hmm. and then use the other approach to further confirm it, right? Yeah. To, try, yeah. To, try, to use that first sort of traditional approach, and I offer sort of Leibnizian and Malarian considerations, try and Okay, can we craft something just by sending yeah. the metaphysician into the field, right? And then once we yeah. have that something crafted, then we can see if maybe there's additional confirmation or something of it 
Does that make sense when I'm talking about? Yeah, I'm curious it does. If you I'm sort of smiling it. at the Malarian considerations. You know, that's a very sophisticated contemporary contemporary line there. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I was going to call it Thomistic at first, but then I had a bunch of Thomas saying this is not Thomas's okay. argument. So I'm like, yeah. all right, I'll back up. <laughs> well, it definitely has that flavor to it, but it it, yeah. it traces a contemporary um, articulation that's mm -hmm. precise and interesting. Um, but yeah, I love how you put that in terms of these two approaches, a kind of classical kind of building with principles to sort of identify a kind of transcendent foundation versus a kind of a big picture hypothesis testing. Maybe it feels a little more kind of scientific. You have the hypothesis, it makes predictions. You kind of consider the theoretical virtues of the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Is it simple? Is it internally consistent? Does it have wide explanatory scope? Does it explain a lot of dimensions of reality? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I'm very sympathetic with your thought here is that you can really combine these. I mean, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about in my own work, how you can kind of use both together, mm -hmm. um, almost like as two witnesses that can help kind of look at the same thing from two different angles. And if the witnesses go together, then, you know, that's great. But if they're kind of speaking in different directions, well, then that's invitation to kind of recheck your steps, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah I agree. That's that's very eloquently said. So let's, Um, I'd love to get, because you sent me two articles that I think are fairly recent on kind of your... Um, oh, yeah, this uh, is, yeah, they're yeah. forthcoming. So they're, they're not even out there yet. And it, it is based on updates in my own thinking, clarifications. Okay, yeah. can we can we talk about that then? Because I yeah, thought these the new were, stuff. Yeah, the yeah. new stuff. I thought these were great. And then we'll talk about persons and, and how we think all this uh, converges and, and hangs together and, and all that good stuff. Oh, real quick, you know, when it comes to the... Yeah. Um, to the second approach, the worldview com comparison approach. One thing that I have been thinking about, I had a, uh, and I think we talked about this, maybe um, just your personal correspondence on email is, is how to divide up the space, um, how we're partitioning things, right? And one of the issues that you run into is if you have kind of, is if, is if you divide it between like theism and naturalism. And I think it's it's really hard to carve things up that way. And you might think mm -hmm. that there's lots of different theisms, but it's, I think it's also hard to cover up naturalism. And I remember you had a way of carving it up that I thought was more useful. And that's either mine first or not mine first. Yeah, yeah. But I don't remember if we talked about this. I, I feel like this might have been in conversation with you. The one I've kind of liked now is either perfect or imperfect. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And And that to me, I think, has a number of benefits of yeah. starting from that framework. And I just wanted to toss that your way and get your, your thoughts yeah. on it. If you see the kind of problems I'm chasing down and why. Yeah. I might... like that because mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to divide theories according to um, basic concepts. And <clears throat> when I say basic concepts, I guess really what I mean is concepts that would be familiar to human beings earlier in their life. You know, like my kids, they, they learn the concept of yes. And the concept of no, they con they, they learn the concept of a mind, you know, so th these are early concepts, whereas the concept of uh, material things or even physical things that gets a little bit more technical and sophisticated. And it, it's interesting because that term has such a wide semantic range mm -hmm. where you have scientists and philosophers who would call themselves naturalists or physicalists who also think there's a kind of mind first. Uh, the base of reality is mental in some yeah. way. Um, whereas a lot of people would associate physicalism and naturalism with the mindless first. So mm -hmm. you've got mindless particles that sort of unfold into conscious beings later on. But once I saw that you have mind first theorists that are on the spectrum um, across the physicalist, non-physicalist, naturalist, non-naturalist divide. It, it, but then there's all these associations. I thought, well, let, let's look at the more basic concepts. I'm actually working on a, a presentation right now on how to reclassify the theories um, in the philosophy of mind mm. uh, in a way that's more natural, I think, that tracks the contemporary discussions. And so there's a classical classification, and then there's this new one that I'm wanting to propose. Oh, neat. And it's right along the lines of what you just suggested, the kind of the mind first versus the mindless first and how those different theories branch out. And I also like what you, you propose here about the perfection first versus imperfection first. I think that could have its advantages. One worry that I might have about that is that that word perf perfect also seems to invite a lot of questions about like, well, what do you mean by perfect? 
uh, more than what I see when I use the word mind. Now, people do yeah. wonder, well, what do you mean by mind? That's mm -hmm. a fair question too. But I, I, I find that using the term mind seems to, I don't know, be more intuitive more yeah. quickly for more people. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be kind of maybe my one worry about going with the perfect first versus imperfect. Yeah, I'd be curious how you, because uh, I've thought about that too, of, of how you might try to get around that because there's there's notions of perfection like there's uh kind of species relative perfection which i don't yeah. think we'd, we'd want to take and then there's yeah. the notions of absolute perfection or unbounded yeah. perfection so i'm yeah. thinking more in the in the latter case that's and of right. course you have to yeah. kind of spell that out of what you yeah. mean by that but that's yeah. the uh, maybe that's what you had in mind <laughs> yeah no absolutely yeah. you know and then that process of spelling it out and it can be done you know so i, I think there's definitely value in that in that scheme um all these sort of have their advantages and disadvantages, but I do mm -hmm. think it is so helpful to think about framing before you even get into like arguments. Right. Because I mean, even something simple, I don't know if, if we talked about this last time, but the, the idea that God, people think of God as up there, but then philosophers think of the more fundamental things is down. <laughs> down, right, yeah. And so if, if you're a philosopher and you wanna talk about whether God exists, you wanna talk about whether the foundation Mm -hmm. of reality that the things down there mm -hmm. have a perfect nature or a mind-like nature now, that's what you want to talk about but that's yeah. a framing issue and a lot mm -hmm. of people kind of skate past that um well i've skated past that and then i would discover oh you're objecting to the direction you mm -hmm. know the frame that's causing um some trips here so we can clarify the terrain i think just by by the framing yeah Great. Okay, let's turn to some of your new creations, Josh, on cosmological reasoning. Where do you want to where do you want to start with this? I'm excited. Well, yeah, so I would say kind of the most recent clarification for me has been to understand just a strategy mm -hmm. for identifying fundamental reality, whatever it might be. Um, you know, a lot of scientists and philosophers coming from many different perspectives will grant that there's some kind of fundamental layer to reality. Maybe it's energy um, you know, maybe it's some kind of stuff, you know, we don't know what it is. Uh, you know, we, we could argue for that. Uh, I have this kind of argument that to explain the non-fundamental things in total is going to invite uh, a fundamental thing mm -hmm. to be, to kind of anchor the rest of reality. But once we, if, if we do arrive at some kind of fundamental layer of reality, we can then ask that question, well, what is it? What's its nature? And there are different tools and strategies for thinking about this. You know, you mentioned this sort of big picture theory comparison tool, and that's very helpful. Another kind of tool that I've been thinking about, and this is in the article that I sent you um, on why is there anything, is what I'm calling a clearing away strategy. Mm -hmm. So the, the way this works is you identify characteristics that you have independent reason to think wouldn't be fundamental. Mm. Um, so like for an example, let, let's take leaves. Okay, leaves uh, is the base of reality, the, the most basic stuff of existence, composed of atomic leaves. Mm. When I say atomic, I mean these leaves aren't composed of anything else. <laughs> they're basic, they're fundamental. Right. Mm -hmm. and they're the can't, you can't break them down into anything else, right? That's yeah. right. These, these are the basic structures. And I'm using the, the example of leaves because I think it, it's, it, it may be easy for people to sort of appreciate that we have independent reason for thinking that leaves wouldn't be fundamental. Yeah. And, and what are these reasons? Well, we've got observations, all the leaves we know about sort of grow out of prior states of reality. Mm -hmm. And I also think there's a kind of principle of, of reason that invites us to explain things as far as we can, unless we can identify a, a flag that says, hey, this thing is relevantly different. Yeah. So if, if I'm explaining the leaves in terms of other states, and then somebody says, hey, here's a special leaf this is the uncaused leaf from which everything else is right. birthed. Mm -hmm. My first question is, okay, what makes that special? Mm -hmm. and, you know, does it have some nature that allows it to be foundational that's different from the leaves? And if it does have that nature, well, what is it? And if, if the answer is it has the nature of a leaf, that's not gonna, that's not gonna do it because the leaf nature doesn't signal uh, a relevant difference. Yes. And mm -hmm. so the whole point of the clearing away strategy is to actually clear away all the attributes that don't signal a relevant difference. Right. Because of the track record of explaining things, we have reason to expect an explanation. Mm -hmm. So if it's a shape of a leaf or a shape of a tiger or a pine cone, those shapes don't signal for me in my mind 
a relevant difference. Mm -hmm. And then what, something I love about this approach is that is that anybody can sort of just use it by their own light, by their own mind. They can just ask themselves, like, when I consider the great shape of a pine cone, mm -hmm. does my mind say to me, ah, that's that does it. <laughs> that's the one that says, right. we can see that that, you know, flips into a relevant difference. Right. Um, and then, you know, you can just ask yourself that. And if your own mind says that's not a flag for relevant difference, then by the track record of experience, and, you know, I mean, by the way, this is the same kind of reasoning that leads to scientific progress where we're mm -hmm. expecting an explanation of our observations. Yeah. It's the same kind of reasoning by which we would form laws of physics where we uh, have these laws that explain all these phenomena. Mm -hmm. Those laws could be further explained. Um, but if there's going to be an exception, we want that reason to make the exception. Yeah. So that's the strategy. And yeah, then the question is, what can you get out of this strategy? What can you learn? Yeah. And you can learn, I think, quite a lot. Yeah, it's, this is great. And I, I love that strategy. It actually kind of reminds me a bit of the, um, it's definitely unique in in the way you present it, but reminds me again of that sort of traditional approach where whether people agree with with these identifications or not, you know, the, the metaphys I always imagine a metaphysician out in the field, right? Um, realize, hey, things of this sort, changing things, yeah, those signal a dependency, right? Or composite yeah. things, those signal a dependency. So whatever's going to ultimately kind of hold all this stuff up, right? Whatever's going to be the, the basement to all of it, if you will. Yeah. It can't be something of, of, of that sort of thing, right? Yeah. yeah. And leaves, pine cones. That's right. Yeah. That seems that. Yeah. That, so we can, that, that would be strange. If you we, just we keep generalize. You, yeah, yeah. You dig down. It's just a pine cone. It's a pine cone. There it is. <laughs> yeah. I, but I just want to highlight what you just said about the changing things, right? Because yeah. changing things themselves are kind of a flag for their contingency. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the fact that it could change from a pine cone to a not pine cone mm -hmm. shows that the pine cone is itself a contingent reality. It, it can fail to be, mm -hmm. right? And so then, I mean, there, there are two issues here, and I really want to separate these. One issue has to do with whether the item in question has the flag that says, hey, I'm relevantly different from all the explained things. Mm -hmm. The other is whether it has another flag that says, hey, you know what? I'm not relevantly different. Yeah. So, so, so let, let me just illustrate this a bit because I actually do think that the mere contingency itself is itself a flag that says I'm not relevantly different, mm -hmm. um, that, that says I call for an explanation to explain mm -hmm. why I'm there rather than not. Um, it also doesn't have the flag that says I am a relevant difference. Yeah. And I think both are important because it might be a little bit harder to have the insight that says um, that the flag that says I need to be explained, that might be harder to get. That takes more work in the meadows. The metaphysician has to kind of look, spend more time in the meadows to sort of get mm -hmm. that. Uh, and at least that's been my experience. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but it might be sort of easier to see, oh, this is not telling me that it's a relevant difference. Mm. So I can expect a further explanation. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And so changing things, mm -hmm. they don't cry out for I'm unexplained. Um, on, on the contrary, if anything, they, they call for an explanation or deeper ground. So then this gives us a, a conclusion, which is that a fundamental reality is not in its most fundamental nature, a contingent changing thing fundamentally. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe there's changing aspects that are not fundamental, mm -hmm. um, but the most fundamental nature of the fundamental reality won't be contingent, won't be changing, won't be temporary, mm -hmm. won't be static, won't be blue, won't be bearded, blue, won't be bearded. <laughs> yeah. Won't be, you know, I'm out. So you clear, <laughs> you're out. It's not you. <laughs> it's not your beard. <laughs> That's it. Right. So now you can start to uncover some things. Yeah. And this is where I, I can start getting kind of excited because right. people say you're not supposed to be able to see that deeply in a reality using these tools. Like that's not possible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but here, I think we do have principled reasons to anticipate something. And if you can correlate that with, as you say, predictive success, um, and, you know, this takes some work to sort of see how this works, but you could start to uncover the base of reality. You know, it's not blue. It's not any color. Mm hmm. You know, it's not the shape of a pine cone. It's not any shape. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I mean, quantum physicists, they're, they're saying this. Uh, a lot of them are saying this. Carlo Rovelli talks about how the base of matter is not itself fundamentally described in terms of spatial aspects. Mm -hmm. 
Felipe Leone, in his dialogue with me on Is God the Best Explanation of Things, he cites the scientists in support of this right. because I had given my argument for the non-spatial, non-geometric foundation. Yeah. And so I gave my argument and then he said, well, yeah, the scientists seem to be supporting this too, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that's like a second witness. And then he had questions about whether this is a matter of metaphysical necessity. Well, kind of sweep that to the side. The point here is that mm -hmm. if you clear away the things that aren't relevant differences, then you're going to arrive at a description now of fundamental reality. Yeah. Not contingent. It's not shaped. It's not colored. Right. Well, what is it? Well, whatever it is, it's got resources to be the foundation for everything else. So you might think it has some kind of causal capacities. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, are, are the causal capacities bounded? You know, does it have like a causal capacity to produce leaves, but not thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, then you might wonder, why is it bounded there? You know, why does it have that capacity to produce leaves, but not thoughts? Right. That invites further explanation. If there's no further explanation of the base of reality, then my thought is, is that a nice, simple hypothesis, at least initially, we start with this initially, is that it's filled in with a kind of capacity without artificial boundaries or limits or parameters, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and this is starts to give us some predictions. This is really good. I want to get down some, some mental notes. So I make sure we, we hit uh, a couple of things and already this is starting to get to the idea of breaking theories out or partitioning the space in terms of perfect, what I, which I think is qu as qualitatively unbounded versus yeah. imperfect. That's it. Right? Yeah. Cause you could fill it in with just pure perfection or as you right. say, absolute perfection. That's mm -hmm. going to predict the, um, the power without limits it's yes. going to predict the ability to make thoughts and sturdy existence, right? And, and the necessary sturdy, robust existence. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, yeah, a few things I want to explore here, because this is, this is great. And I, I love how you present this all in, in such a, a simple fashion as, as always, that's why we're in philosophy class. Um, okay. Let's, so yeah, the principle, so the way I sort of think of cosmological reasoning in general is uh, when you go back to some of the, um, more traditional thinkers, um, at least, you know, when I read people like Aquinas and stuff, they didn't seem all that concerned um, about radical unintelligibility. They kind of seemed to just live in the, in the milieu of, yeah, reality is intelligible, right? Mm -hmm. So we're not just going to get to a pine cone and that's going to be the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're going to explain it. We, yeah, we're going to need to get to something that essentially could explain everything else and explain itself right mm -hmm. and by mm -hmm. explanation i don't mean that has to be like an extrinsic efficient cause that would be that would be bad, yeah. right but it, but at least it would be com completely intrinsically intelligible like if we could wrap our mind around it right yeah yeah which which means it would have to be a very very special sort of something right and then yeah they sort of just strip away the things that you've been talking about well what sort of things would sort of land us in just a sort of arbitrary stopping point you know, a brute fact, if you will. Well, yeah, limits, bounds, geometry, colors, colors, beard, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, composition was turtle. another another yeah, turtle yeah. composition. Disney yeah. princess. I love all your examples. Ingve Malmsteen. You like? I'm pretty sure if we dig down, the song gonna, beat it. The music. song beat it. <laughs> that was your example to me. Do yeah, you know. so Peter, just get down. You start yeah. hearing the do 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 do. That's it. That's the base of reality. That's it. That's it. All springs, for, all springs for beat it right. Yeah. I guess I'd take that over the pine cone. Um, oh yeah, but of That'd course, and, and like I have to admit, like that just seems that seems so right to me. But of course, the challenge in more contemporary times is like, well, look, maybe reality just isn't intelligible in the way that you want it to be, right? That's a challenge. So, yeah. Yeah. so the, the challenge then uh, seems to be if you're going to do cosmological reasoning, uh, you sort of, yeah, I guess you need to spend a bit of time on that principle of explanation, right? And okay, well, why is this a sturdy principle of, of explanation? How sturdy or strong can we make it? And this is why I tried to include, I guess, the two approaches I did in my book. One is the, the approach that's... It, it, in the same family as, as what you're doing. You start off with this principle of explanation, say, here's reasons why I think this is a good, a good guide. Right. And uh, maybe the best way to ultimately defend it is to show like what happens if you deny it and you kind of link it up with science and stuff like that. Or mm -hmm. uh, I know other people like uh, will go further and say, you're just actually going to wind up in some really crazy skepticism if you yeah. try to chop this thing down. Right. So maybe you can't argue up to it, uh, but maybe you can show it's something we need to, have in place if we're going to make any arguments or something whatsoever mm -hmm. right um yeah. so that's i guess a, a strategy 
and maybe I'll just pause there and get your comments and all yeah, that yeah. before, I, before I, I say anything I, else, right? Mm -hmm. I, lo I love that you brought up this worry that, you know, may maybe the need for an explanation is sort of a human psychological need and reality doesn't um, strive to meet our needs. <laughs> right. It's not, and, here to make, not here to make us happy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Sean Carroll, uh, he emailed me with this worry. He emailed me. It wasn't just out of the blue. Uh, this was back when Proust and I were working on our Necessary Existence book. And we sent him a draft of it. And so he gave some comments on one of our chapters, which I was very grateful for. He offered beautiful comments. And one of his comments that I, I found kind of the most helpful and interesting was just exactly what you're talking about here, which is the idea that uh, maybe, maybe this desire for an explanation is a kind of human desire and reality doesn't live to meet our desires, right? And so what we wanted to do was to talk about some of the things you're talking about, where we motivate this principle. We linked it to science. That was one of our connections that um, you, maybe it is true that we would have this desire, you know, just like we might have this instinct to think that two plus two equals four. There is that instinct, right? But just because you have an instinct towards something doesn't mean you don't also have independent reasons to support that the instinct matches with reality. So we do take some time to motivate the track record of explaining things. Um, you know, I mean, in, in that chapter, we allow for the possibility that somebody could have some other reasons that could weigh on the other side. This is why we also offer paths through just possible explanations. We offer various paths that come to the same conclusion. Um, but I think you're right. I think there is a kind of steep cost if you start saying that certain things don't have an explanation, but especially if you do that without any motivation. This yeah. is the point that I was making about the flags. If if the pine cone doesn't have a flag that says on it, hey, you know what? There's a reason to think that I'm special and unexplained. If it doesn't mm -hmm. even have that, then the track record of explanation gives you a reason to expect an explanation of that pine cone. And that that's a that's enough as a tool to make some headway in your own thinking about, okay, well, let's shave off the things that would call for further explanation from our theory of fundamental reality. And then what, what do we have left? And then we have something kind of interesting, something relevantly different from the explained things. Yeah, that's, that's great. The other thing I wanted to, um, <clears throat> actually, why don't I let you kind of finish your presentation or, or thoughts on, on this clearing away strategy or, or mm -hmm. path before I keep uh, interjecting if you had had any more. Well, let's see, I think I wanted just to maybe connect it back with your idea of, of perfection. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that this is one way you can sort of fill in your theory of fundamental reality as a kind of absolutely perfect quality. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like to kind of have a wide net and invite all the theorists from all perspectives yeah. to kind of bring their contribution. Because I do think that, that you know, wh whether you are, how do I want to put this? I don't want to say willing, but like wh whether you're in a position to... Um, think that reality is fundamentally perfect, you might still be in a position to think that it's not, it's not a pine cone, it's not even a shape that mm -hmm. seems to correlate with recent physics and this fits with the clearing away strategy. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of my, my main kind of final thought here is just, I think this general approach can bring theorists from a wide range of perspectives to kind of by their own light, sort of explore, okay, I mean, this is the question for the audience, you know, what would be to the, the a, a view of a fundamental reality that fills it in with attributes that don't themselves uh, call for further explanation or that are relevantly different from things that, that are like colors and shapes that would have a further explanation. And then just see see what you come up with there. And I think that will lead to a form of progress. Yes, yeah, I, I agree. So maybe now we can look towards the, the prediction side if you think that's appropriate, Josh. I was just writing another uh, uh, article today, a simpler one, where I was reflecting on the worries I used to have as a young child. And uh, I remember I would look out my grandparents' window, and I didn't I didn't know words like contingency or even philosophy at the time. But I would wonder, well, not just like why does any of this exist? Like why are there row homes here, and why do I exist? But like, why does it continue to exist, right? Yeah. And like, am I gonna go to sleep tonight and just like blip out of existence? So it's not just to me like it's not like this would seriously haunt me as like a six or yeah. seven year old, right? Because like wow. I'm looking around, I'm like, where's the anchor here, right? I had no idea, right? Um, I wonder how many six or seven year olds are one wondering about that, worried about that. I wonder if there was like a survey, we got the percentage and then what that would predict about your future. I think it might've had something <laughs> to do with, you know, 
the amount of high fructose corn syrup and cigarettes and stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what keeps I have me theory. in existence? I might yeah, just I, have, I, I, yeah, about yeah. those words. But I, and not only that, but like not even getting into considerations of the fine tuning argument, but it also seemed like pretty remarkable that things existed in a relatively orderly way mm -hmm. as well. And these things seemed a lot uh, now they certainly, I, I wasn't thinking about it clearly back then, but I can realize the reason I was worried about each of these things independently is they do seem logically independent. Mm -hmm. The fact that anything exists does not to my mind entail that it continues to exist. Right. At least mm -hmm. not on the first yeah. impression or that anything has to exist in any sort of orderly fashion at all so i want an explanation of all of those things that's right i mean if there's a continuing law that says hey things that exist must continue to exist what about that continuing law what key, what continues well, it keeps that it, maybe it keeps itself into existence right it then but then it has a kind of self-existence at that point yes or something i mean you know because there is this question for the deep explanation mm -hmm. of why do things not just exist but persist what yes. explains that, right? Right, and that's I think yeah. that's a haunting uh, question, especially if you want to rest easy at night, right? Um, yeah. And and to me, what we've been getting at seems to like score pretty well on those three things. If you have something that is absolutely perfect or following Aquinas that is qualitatively unbounded, that's how I'm thinking of perfection again, mm -hmm. along the transcendentals, um, and has an essence that just guarantees its existence right well then it is a law that something has to exist right but that yeah. law reflects that deeper thing that's it um yeah. so something has to exist it has to keep existing and then maybe we haven't quite explored the mind aspect of it. we're going to get there yeah. maybe it would be a sort of thing that could order the other things yeah that it yeah, exists yeah. as well and like these things might seem really simple and they are like they're very commonplace but in a sense, like these are, I think they're like the most profound things. Well, yeah, I agree. Like, forget that. the amoeba. We can talk about the amoeba. That's an amazing thing. But we, like, we can get eight, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's uh -huh. more fundamental things, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. about persistence and existence that creates kind of a framework for even thinking about the amoeba, right? Right. And I, and I was just going to say a, a metaphor here um, to kind of illustrate the idea of persistence. Imagine you have like an ocean with some waves coming in and out, right? And you might wonder about these waves. These waves are changing form of the ocean. They don't continue to exist. The particular mm -hmm. wave kind of goes away and gets mm -hmm. replaced with a new wave. Yeah. So they're not persisting. But in order for there to be any waves at all, there's got to be something underlying them, right? Like the ocean or, you know, mm -hmm. wh whatever the ocean is made of. And then the ocean persists and it allows the waves to come into mm -hmm. being and go out of being, you know, that, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a foundational existence that it persists because it cannot not exist. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's like the deep explanation or a, a way of thinking about this. And if, if I could add just one more note here. Please can, add, add a lot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just what you were saying about self um, explanation. I've been thinking about this because this connects up with intelligibility. Mm -hmm. The idea is that uh, we can understand intelligibility in terms of explicability. Things can be explained. And one way you could think about this is like everything that exists is either explained in terms of prior conditions that en enable or empower its existence or cause its existence, or somehow it's explained in terms of the kind of thing it is, its nature. And um, I I've been thinking a lot about this because part of me wants to say, well, nothing can strictly explain itself. And I think there's a way of understanding explanation as a kind of asymmetric grounding where I would wanna say it doesn't really strictly explain itself. But there's another sense in which we can understand why the thing exists by understanding the kind of thing it is. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's a way in which you could think of it as kind of self-existent or self-explaining. You understand, oh, it is this unbounded qualitative uh, perfection, this pure perfection, absolute, complete, unbounded. And then we can sort of see by reason that anything like that would have that sturdy greatness, that sturdy perfection, those powers would last. They wouldn't just, it wouldn't be able to be, destroyed, fall apart. Th then we can sort of see into why, if it's like that, it would necessarily exist and necessarily persist. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really good. So I like what you say. That's a good clarification. Obviously, I think all causes are invoked as explanations, but I, I don't think all explanations are causes. Yeah. Um, there you go. And what, if we're looking for something that would have to explain everything else and explain itself, I think, again, it's, and certainly this is, this is the case of, of, most people making these types of cosmology arguments are not saying that 
we can wrap our mind around this self-explained thing. Just that if we think there has to be something that could be self-explanatory, it would it would be quite a very special thing, right? Like it couldn't yeah. be like any of these other things. And yeah, we have we may reason not have to direct think of that acquaintance or direct insight into the inner workings of the nature, but there's right. reasons kind of from the effects or from the, the the causes to think there is something that has a nature such that if we did have insight into it, we could see uh th those inner workings yeah you know, the, like, the like mystery the, would be yeah. removed yeah 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 although i mean I, I guess i i confess you know when i do think about um perfection there is something about that concept that does seem to point to that necessary existence necessary persistence mm -hmm. there is a way in which there is a kind of illumination there that that i think that that i have which isn't to say that you know i have all the insight into the inner nature or anything but yeah Maybe we can actually get more light, maybe even than we've thought. Possibly. I agree. I agree with you. I love. I love the work and the thought you've 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 done on that, and more on I guess on the ontological argument side. And in fact, I think that's uh, your conversation with Kenny Pierce was really good. The one that you had on on Cameron's channel not too long ago, because um, I, I I do like the way that he sort of thinks about the ontological argument. I don't know whether he endorses it as a separate argument, but he he says it. It's a nice, it gives us a nice theoretical posit to complete the cosmological argument. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Um, yeah, to fill in sort of the theoretical framework of the nature. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what other, before we turn to, to persons and the stuff you've been doing on Conscious of Mind, uh, I mentioned, I think, a few good, accurate pr predictions. What else, where else do you think this theory, Josh, picks up some uh -huh. good confirmatory support? And I think we should also probably, for sake of completeness, think of uh, if it picks up some disconfirmation along the lines. As yeah, well. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So on both sides of that, so well, in, in my book, How Reason Can Lead to God, I talk about the four M's, mm -hmm. uh, matter, the configuration of matter to turn into complex creatures. Mm -hmm. There's a question about the fine tuning of the conditions and physics for matter to do that. This is not 100% prediction. This is a probability. Uh, this has to do with probability. So a foundational a mind or foundational being with the resources of a mind might contribute to a positive probability of a universe finely tuned to produce the kinds of things that minds evidently are interested in, right. which would be um, complexities, organizations, order, mm -hmm. um, even interesting relationships. You know, mm -hmm. those are things that minds are quite interested in. So that's one thing. So matter, and then there's a moral landscape, uh, the mathematical landscape, which we can sort of include uh, in that reasoning, you know, the power to reason, as well as even the principles of, of correct and proper reasoning. Those are parts of reality. We could think about kind of the deepest explanation for those things. And, uh, and mind itself, that's the fourth, fourth one, mind. This will lead us into my latest book, which is kind of all about that, mm -hmm. existence and emergence of conscious beings. Mm -hmm. You can wonder, how did we get here? Yeah. You know, out of the dust of the earth, emerging right. conscious beings like that. So, so I, I think of this sort of foundational mind, I'm kind of filling in the foundational perfection with the perfection of, of uh, a perfect mind mm -hmm. as providing independent probabilistic predictions for the configuration of matter, moral landscape, mathematical uh, track tracks of reason and reasoning, mm -hmm. and as well as other minds. Um, so those would be four examples. Those aren't the only, we could talk about beauty, you know, we could talk about yeah. other kinds of predictions. The song beat but, it. Yeah. This, yeah. That's right. That emerged, right? That, that's very <laughs> yeah. specific, but songs in general, right? I mean, right, huh? I think about that, you know, the quantum field gives rise to songs. It's like, well, that's, that's not something to take for granted. No, it's not. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, and these are large scale features or general Richard Swinburne talks about general features of reality that we are observing, that we witness. And then we're talking about a deep explanation of those features. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could just add here, it, it's not that, you know, sometimes people talk about naturalism and, and they'll say, well, naturalism can explain all of those things. Okay. And in, in my dialogue with Felipe, um, I actually talk about how naturalism itself, if, if, if we think of naturalism as there's a natural order, mm -hmm and we can investigate this empirically okay and that there's a categorical uniformity in the natural order then we could actually think of this natural order as itself one more prediction that you might find more probable more predicted 
on this mind first hypothesis mm -hmm. that the mind would unfold into a rational natural order of things um and so I, I don't really see a sharp distinction or competition between a broad notion of naturalism and um and, and, and theism mm -hmm. uh, and in fact there's a philosopher peter forrest he's got a book god without the supernatural mm -hmm. the scientific defense of theism and he's very explicit about arguing for a natural foundation that has these powers and mentality. It's not, it's not supernatural in, in his vocabulary. Mm -hmm. and they explain these large scale features. Now, if, if we want to tighten up our naturalism so that it kind of by definition precludes this kind of mind first foundation, mm -hmm. right? Well, then you're going to start losing some of that predictive success. Um, it, it's not part of the mindless first theory that there's going to be minds or fine tuned universe or that there's yeah. going to be morality. None, none of that is predicted from the hypothesis that reality is fundamentally mindless. Yes. So to pick up the prediction, usually the way this works is um, it, it is we add to the to the theory. We say reality is fundamentally mindless, and it has powers to produce this, produce this, and it has powers to produce this, and it has powers to produce this. Mm -hmm. And we, we can do that. Absolutely. But just the observation here is that now we're adding components to our theory and that adds it. complexity to the base theory, right? Mm -hmm. To the fundamental assumptions we're making, yes. adding more of them to regain that predictive success. Yeah. And this is why it's so important if you're thinking about theories of the world to look both at the predictive success, but also at the simplicity, the number of parts in your base theory. Yeah. And and third, to make sure that your base theory um, is if, if you're going to give an alternative theory to another theory like theism, that your base theory is an alternative, that it competes with and precludes the original theory, because otherwise it actually could harmonize with the original theory. This is yes. This, this is the way in which I think theism and naturalism can actually work together in, in a harmonious way. Sure. As long as we don't chop off uh, or we don't, let's say, add to the naturalism, these uh, additional. The and, and nothing else clause yeah, or something yeah, like that. That's right. right. Like, and mm -hmm. it's mindless and nothing. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, there's a what, lot there. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's, that's really good. So maybe we should talk a little bit about that theoretical virtue for a bit because I agree with everything that you said. I think if you just start with a principle of mindlessness or indifference or whatever, um, I get almost no expectations from that. Um, so I think that's right. I think you have to start kind of wiring uh, wire other components into that theory. And then if if you think that um, simpler theories are generally better, that might not be the, the best um, news. Whereas if um, you don't um, <clears throat> for theism, you might not have that issue because then I would get your your thoughts on this. Right. And this is this is something that came out of I thought this was a fruitful part of discussion in uh, Kenny Pierce's. Uh, exchange with with Graham Oppie of of how they think about simplicity, yeah. And Pierce likes to make the claim, and I think this is right, that it matters most on the fundamental level, and uh, and yeah, we want we want uh, a, a theory that really can I like the way you put it, Josh. It can explain the most with the least, right? That yeah, can, the, and that can explain the most with the least. I mean, obviously, there are some theories that are so simple uh, and so elegant that are obviously false, like that nothing exists, right? So we need we need something so we need something yeah. going on right we need something yeah. going on and i think the major problem with theism that uh at least superficially um again is not that uh is not that it does not explain a lot with very little in terms of a fundamentally simple theory um is that maybe it uh maybe it over predicts right That's and then this this is where we get to the, the yeah. problem of evil so it sticks its neck out too far it actually predicts too much right it predicts that the world would be better than it is that's right you know, there'd right. be less suffering or no suffering yeah so let's get your updated thoughts on on all that because we've talked about the problem of evil before and i know you've done it on our shows we don't have to rehearse the whole story i'm just curious if uh you you have any updated thoughts on that or if it's still that you're um well, yeah, no, I mean, I continue to think about these things um, it, 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 and I feel like I just want to offer kind of like an expression of appreciation for the many different people kind of thinking about this from many, many different perspectives in the complexity of this question about how a predictive theory, especially if it's a theory that is going to predict that the world is sort of governed by 
a mind that is positively oriented, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that that's aiming for the good. And then you experience suffering. You know, I was telling you that I got really sick last week. Well, mm -hmm. if the fundamental mind has access to me, it could stop me from getting sick, it could keep me, keep me well. Uh, you might think that that prediction now has failed the observation. Right. And I always just want to express appreciation for that perspective and that worry. And nothing that I want to say uh, is, is supposed to diminish that or respond to that or say that that's not completely viable and, and, and right. reasonable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and you and I, we've talked about this through email, that there's a lot of data. And, you know, th there, there can be a picture that's yeah. reasonable on one set of data. But then once you get a larger set of data, that original picture no longer is going to be reasonable to you and the larger data. But then somebody else who has an even larger set of data says, oh, that original picture was reasonable. And then somebody else has even a larger set of data. So like, there's this phenomenon where people can sort of feel like they have the larger set of data. Sure. And they're looking at the others with the smaller set of data. Mm -hmm. And I just want to observe that, highlight that. That's part of the nature of the complexity of, of this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well stated. But, Very well stated. Yeah. But, but for me, I mean, I guess just one kind of general thought that I have about this is that there's actually a little bit of an irony uh, when I think about the problem of evil, because the irony is that I find it unexpected that a sort of mindless or even, even an indifferent mental being would unfold to produce the kinds of sort of, I want to say character developing or soul making adventure stories um, that it looks to me that there's evidence of. Yeah. And this evidence comes from observing human interactions. It also comes from hearing people's stories, mm -hmm. uh, including very interesting stories of sort of these near-death experiences. People report their stories right. of the higher purpose and how every part of their life, you know, in their life review. And this is often, by the way, contrary to their expectations that they would even experience this, mm -hmm. going against their, their worldview. Um, and they come back changed. But they, they say in, in these life reviews like that all of the connect, human connections and relationship connections, they there was a positive intention for love and that had ripple effects from person to person. Right. And the very challenges of our life, like me being sick, you know, it creates these opportunities. When I was sick, I woke up the next morning. I fully hoped that I could get some rest, get taken care of. I came out of my room. Rachel was wiped out asleep on the chair. Caleb, the nine month old, was crying, coughing, and crawling in a diaper across <laughs> the floor. Lana comes downstairs, starts throwing up. Micah's coughing. Jonah's coughing. <laughs> We're yeah. all sick. Okay. You've been there. So there's a certain challenge. Now, how are we going to speak to each other? How, how are we going to interact with each other? You know, can, can we show each other love in this situation? And what does that mean? What does that look like? And, and then what are the effects of that down the road? Mm -hmm. If you're in a Twitter conversation and somebody's rubbing you the wrong way, okay, they're demeaning you. They're calling you a liar. <laughs> they're, they're saying, On well, Twitter. now this is, this is an interesting opportunity because it can kind of stretch your soul. Now, what does lo love look like here? Yeah. Real love, not, not this kind of like self-righteous, like, look at me, I'm so loving. No, mm -hmm. a kind of love where the other person feels honored. They feel built up they feel valued and cherished how do you achieve that in this circumstance mm -hmm. so I, I really do think that these are special situations that arise out of states of limitation mm. and i would kind of just to be honest all my cards on the table kind of anticipate that if fundamental reality is is positively oriented that it's going to um result in and in, in these epic uh grand soul building love opportunity stories the challenge though of course we don't see the whole picture and sometimes right. we'll see somebody's life ruined and washed away mm -hmm. and, and if that's it well then that would be um disconfirmation right but see here's the problem swinburne makes this point i was just reviewing a, um, a debate book this hasn't come out it's a debate book for with oxford uh, between swinburne and jim sturba who has a book against God. On the problem of evil, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Swinburne. 
Has Twitter and still publishing. Wow. God bless yeah, them. So they got yeah. into a debate and then I was assigned to review their debate. And it was amazing that their debate, their exchange is like, oh, this is, this is interesting. Yeah. And they, they go into quite some detail. But one of the points that Swinburne makes in that book, uh, I guess I can't reveal this yet because it has not been published, but yeah, um, but it's a point that I've independently made myself, which is that you have to be really careful to distinguish between the actual data that you're observing and the expectations you would have on a theory. Mm. Right. So, um, you know, if you're a theist, you might have an expectation, let's say, of life after death, but you don't want to build in that expectation of life after death as as part of your data to say, mm -hmm. well, we know there's life after death. Therefore, that explains evil. Yeah. You might be able to count NDEs as some form of data, but you, you could use right. that as some form of data that mm -hmm. that. Yeah. But even then you're inferring from the reports. Yep. Um, and then but, but here, here's the point. It's like on the other side, you also want to be careful to not include the no life after death mm -hmm. as part of your data either. Right. And so what Swinburne argues for in this book is that one of his points is that if there's a theory that explains a lot of the data and also even explains why in these states of limitations, we wouldn't always have direct access to the full picture mm -hmm. because that's kind of part of the hero making adventure. Um, then it's, it's difficult to make an argument against that picture from an assumption that there is no life after death. You know, unless you have independent way of of confirming that, right? Mm -hmm. So, so this is where this is where I guess you know this is what I was saying. All all my cards on the table. I, I would actually say at least general observations of challenge, of problems, of of suffering that can um, engender these opportunities, together with an independent prediction from the theistic story, which is that all things would be used for good so that yeah. there would be life after death. Mm -hmm. um, I would kind of think of this, this data as almost actually supporting the theism, mm. in, uh, at least the general features of evil. It's not to say that every experience supports theism, not suggesting that. I think there right. are hard cases that could go against, mm -hmm. um, but that, I don't know. I like, I just wouldn't imagine out of mindless or indifferent grains of reality that there would be any, any story that ever emerges where any being even wonders how we got here. You know, right. it, it's like, to me, it's like turning on the TV. There's static. Okay. Complete static. You go to a station that's not programmed, complete mm -hmm. static. So this represents the mindlessness. There's no intention in the static to produce a movie, but just by chance and time characters emerge. Yes. And the characters emerge just again by chance. And it's not just, it's continuing chance. It's like right now, like what you say about persistence, it's not just the origin of the universe. It's like right now, mm -hmm. the continuing state of reality is fundamentally mindless particles, okay? Not caring about the, the songs that are emerging from it, not mm -hmm. caring about the drama that's emerging. So imagine that on this screen, you got these characters and they're, they're beginning to have a, um, a conversation with each other about how they came to be. And all this is generated by mindless noise. And then they're wondering about, you know, these challenges, some of which they see actually carve character and carve new opportunities and experiences. Some of them, though, they don't see where it leads to. You know, that person just left the scene. You know, the soul go on. Do, do they continue on? We can't see that. Mm -hmm. So they're wondering how they got here. All the while, the whole thing is generated by mindless, indifferent noise. I mm -hmm. just, yeah, I, I just find that not, uh, not expected. Like, I just yeah. find that mm -hmm. unlikely. Yeah. I'm, and I'm obviously with you on, on all of that. And I love your, your great story that you have and, and how reason can lead to God. And that's interesting to hear. Um, I has, cause I know Swinburne is in, in contrast with, um, Doherty. Doherty actually thinks that a theistic theory, once you analyze it entails an afterlife. Um, I guess I'm probably more in, inclined towards that, but I appreciate your point about, um, well, really, what we're trying to get after is are there gratuitous evils? Uh, yeah, I think right? Swinburne say it does does make the afterlife more probable. Um, but yeah, I, but he yeah. has independent. He kind of raises the bar high for himself, so he yeah. doesn't want to just assume that his independent evidence that with theism would make an afterlife mm -hmm. more probable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm sympathetic with the idea that if you really un unpack the concepts of this foundational mind that loves us and knows us, yeah, and the concept of our of our value, I do think that. 
at the very least makes the probability higher. I, I'm okay with entailment. You know, it just it, it would be the case. Yeah, know? and I wonder if there's any other sort of constraints. And I guess this is where maybe the metaphysician in the meadows or the field might be helpful, where, you know, even apart from the just kind of fitting their hypothesis, they're just kind of like discovering things about reality that might help us to see more clearly on some of these issues. So yeah. I'll give you an example. I, I think of like von Ingwagen's considerations of vagueness and arbitrariness. Yeah. And those, I, I think I'm very much convinced by considerations like that, that um, there might be a general policy uh, that God has to adhere to, to set the best conditions for a particular outcome. Uh, but, you know, the number of interventions <laughs> might be yeah. arbitrary, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's what, which might mean that there might be a general reason for why the suffering of the world happens, but there might not actually be no, uh, there might not be a specific reason for, for why this particular instance yeah, happened it. as well. And uh, I don't think that's incompatible with other calm theodicies or whatever, but I think mm. that like discoveries like that, which you might not see if you're not kind of just doing other independent work. Yeah. Um, I think are really powerful and then maybe even more other traditional metaphysical commitments like, Hey, if, if God really is this unique and you know, God is pure goodness itself and God's will just is goodness itself, but God creates other things. They're not going to be like that. Right. So the type of freedom creatures have is going to be very much different than the type of freedom mm -hmm. God has. Maybe there's constraints there, right. Yeah. That factor into the sorts of things God can create. I don't want to explore all of that now, but just sure, sure. You see, you see yeah. what I'm well, getting it, at. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and even the idea that there could be some kind of agreement between God and creature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these NDEs talk about a pre-birth contract. Now, whether that you think about that as a kind of hypothetical agreement, you know, that mm -hmm. they, they would agree, or whether they actually did agree be, before coming in, in, into uh, being being born. Either way, the idea is that um, you know th this is also something that if you have a kind of mind-first ontology. It's going to open up that possibility and, and maybe even just raise its probability um, yeah. so that if somebody's saying, hey, you know, like this, this would never happen. Um, well, you know, again, we don't see that full picture. And so, you know, th this is not sort of a, a cop out because, again, I want to go back and say, I do appreciate that there can be states of suffering and limitation. My dad's been suffering. Um, his, his health is failing. I'm very sorry to hear and that. And it's one of those things where we're surrounding him with a combination of you know prayer and wisdom and, and it seems like every step we try fails and my dad would be the first one to say that pain has a purpose um and yet he himself is struggling you know saying mm -hmm. he's telling me he's, he's losing the battle in his mind mm -hmm. um and so i, I just i, I really want to like emphasize like that the, these are real life issues and it's you can't you can't sort of put a theodicy band-aid on, on this Right. Um, and just like solve all the questions, mm -hmm. you know, in fact, I, I really do think the questions are the seeds for greater wisdom. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. sometimes the effort to give an answer or a solution can sometimes create almost like it, it, it takes those seeds out too fast or something. Yes. And sometimes yes. I think people are actually maybe protecting their seeds a little bit. I think mm -hmm. that instinct to protect their seeds is an instinct from wisdom. It's actually, if I can use my language, God himself is wanting the person who's kind of struggling and maybe skeptical of, of God mm -hmm. to protect some of those seeds of questions and doubts, because mm -hmm. that's going to sprout into some, some wisdom uh, yeah. that's important. I agree. I agree with all of that. And, you know, I've, I've wrestled with a lot of very hard questions, sometimes quite unsuccessfully, but I think the one that has had the most practical, spiritually useful in my life has been the problem of evil, which is the hardest, which is the hardest question, yeah. of course, Russell. So I really appreciate those, those thoughts, Josh. I know this could take up a whole episode just on that. Do we yeah. still have time to talk about minds and persons? Yeah, I want to do it. Yeah. Yes. Because it's definitely related to everything we're talking about. You yeah. Know, the so mind is like a window into reality. So let's, what can we see? let's do it. You yeah. have a lot in your book. I would love to explore all of it with you, but I want you to decide where we should pick up the, the line uh, first okay. on this, on this topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have two thoughts that come to my mind just kind of in this moment. Yep. Um, one is related to what we were just talking about in terms of surviving the destruction, the scattering of our atoms. Mm -hmm. um, did you by chance get to the, the last chapter where I talk about the destruction problem? I did in your original, but not okay. in the newest one. So if yeah. you changed it much, I might be missing some some content. Yeah, it's been definitely developed since the yeah. original, but mm -hmm. I think you got kind of the concept. Yeah. So I want to kind of touch on that a little bit. 
um, right. so that the challenge of creating beings like us, but then also destroying us, mm. you know, we don't have to appeal to God's love for us to see a certain kind of argument or, or problem with the, with the idea that we could even, uh, in principle, just by scattering atoms be destroyed. So I'll yeah, say a little right. more about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then if, if we have time, I was thinking, that a, a little bit of a minor note that I don't unpack so much in the book, but I, I've been thinking about, and I've been thinking this is a very powerful note, um, is has to do with causal exclusion. It has to do with the problem of how we could, with our minds, make a difference through intention, like I can intend to raise my hand. Mm -hmm. And then this problem of how if the foundation is mindless grains of reality, that threatens to causally exclude the power of my mind. Yeah. And then kind of how, how we can deal with that. Great. That, that all sounds great. Yeah. 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 All right. So destruction. Yeah. Okay. So let me, let me prepare my thoughts by, by getting a drink here. Yeah. I, I'm, sad. I'm sad because I destroyed all of my coffee. So <laughs> I'm out. I have to switch to water now. <laughs> I'm making you jealous with the coffee. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, wow. So the reason this is the last chapter mm -hmm. is because I take the whole book uh, to talk about these different theories of the kind of being that could think, that could feel, that could organize consciousness into a single field of experience. Yeah. Right. So it's not just like that some part of my brain is experiencing some of my thoughts and then another part of my brain is experiencing some of my emotions. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, there's me having yeah. thoughts and emotions at once. Right. Mm hmm. And I really appreciate it at the beginning of your book, you do spend a lot of time not just assuming that, but you engage eliminativism and illusionism and all these other. Yeah. Um, so for just for people's awareness, you do spend a, a lot of time on the, those issues yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, eliminating consciousness and why I even think I have consciousness, why I even think I have thoughts. Um, we spend some time on, on just the ground level questions, right? Yep. And then, then I begin to move into this problem of like constructing of being like you. And a lot of people watching this, listening to this, they're going to be familiar with the hard problem of consciousness. Mm -hmm. David Chalmers, a philosopher of mind, by the way, not coming at this from a theist perspective, mm -hmm. I had email co conversation correspondence with Chalmers about his kind of larger worldview. And he, he, do, he doesn't think that there is a necessarily existing or necessarily persisting foundation of reality. At least last time I, I was in contact with him about yeah. this. He's just gearing up for... Uh... But he's just Vir thinking virtual about this. words, virtual worlds. <laughs> yeah, that's his, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Project, he, yeah. Yeah. Just, just thinking about this through the window of, of mind mm -hmm. and over his own career, having a kind of a transition of, of his own analysis. Mm -hmm. and so he develops this kind of hard problem. of How do you explain this sort of qualitative first person experiential mm -hmm. aspects of like smelling coffee or listening to the song, beat it mm -hmm. in your mind. You got that song stirring in your mind. Or if you're sleeping, you've got mental images rotating. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how do those phenomena like emerge out of atoms knocking each other, or fields and rippling with each other? Right. You know, I, I mean, there is a kind of temptation to say, well, the, those mental phenomena just aren't real. Okay, mm -hmm. but if they are real, like if there really are those images, if there really are those sounds and smells and experiences that you experience, there's really you, the being who. Uh, binds together the mm -hmm. richness of your consciousness into a single field. Mm -hmm. uh, how how did the mindless stuff sort of turn into or generate the mental? Yeah. So so a lot of people are familiar with the hard problem. In fact, I've seen it's broken out of this obscure field of philosophy, and even scientists now are, are talking about mm -hmm. the hard problem. I've been reading about that. But what's less known are a set of other problems that. Uh, that that are very serious and severe problems that have led many different theorists to change their view about mm -hmm. the nature of reality, just thinking about these problems. And so while I do talk about the hard problem in my book, I also talk about these other problems. Uh, there, there's a, a personal identity problem mm -hmm. of how you can be you from one moment to the next, even right. as atoms are swapped in and out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The problem. There's this binding problem. Mm -hmm. I kind of mentioned this already of like how even if there are conscious things, they can come together to form a single conscious thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's all sorts of, of, of problems that I talk about in the book, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but you could sort of kind of 
think of them all together as pointing to a general problem, which I call the construction challenge or the construction sure. problem. Mm -hmm. And this is the problem of seeing how in principle, a being like you, and, and, and after kind of my work in the first stage of the book, identifying the elements of you and saying you're organized by what I call a first person self. So you're a being that you can know through self-awareness. And I call this self-realism that you're really there. You really are real. Yeah. You really do have thoughts. And it's not that you in self-awareness see all of yourself. It's that mm -hmm. you are seeing a reality of mm -hmm. yourself. And then the question is, well, how do you take the mindless stuff and construct a self um, in light of the hard problem, in light of the identity problem, in light of this problem of persistence, the combination problem, and other problems. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then the hard problem sharpens when you look at the particular aspects of the mind. It's not just feeling, it's, it's thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, in the book, I, I have this theorem, I call it the mindful thoughts theorem, where I take some first principles that many people would um, say are true just by inspecting their thoughts. And I actually show how I think you can verify that they are true mm -hmm. through self-awareness of your thoughts. And then I deduce a theorem that thoughts themselves can't be uh, uh, made out of mindless ingredients. Just yeah, you did. A, I want to compliment you. Your counting argument is a very technical argument, but you did a wonderful job. The three iterations in your book. Yeah. I was I was so impressed. I was like, it's it's brave. I kind of felt the same way with Miller's argument. I'm like, I love this argument, but how am I ever going to get this into a book that that it's, great. Yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah, it's you. so hard. So I just want to yeah. appreciate like you did. You did. So, I was so impressed. I was so impressed. Yeah, Yeah, uh -huh. I appreciate that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, um, I, I worked on I remember going to LA Fitness, like working out and thinking yeah. about how to distill the argument. Mm -hmm. In fact, actually, the process of presenting it helped me to see a, a new line that I think is actually more intuitive than even in my um, latest technical public pu uh, published work, my peer yeah. review published work. Mm -hmm. So, so, so there are many different problems with constructing a being like you, mm -hmm. and we don't have time to go into those or really unpack them in a lot of detail, but just to point to these many different problems. And then, and then in the last chapter, this is kind of a discovery for me, just in the process of working through this was that there's a kind of symmetrical problem that if, if you can't build the kind of being that you are just by assembling um, bits of sand, just as an example, you know, whether it's sand or carbon molecules, um, or even by the way, thoughts. Now you can't build you by taking a pattern of thoughts or pattern of mental images. Mm -hmm. You're actually deeper in, uh, you're prior to those things. Mm -hmm. And so if you can't construct a conscious being out of these contents of consciousness, whether they're shaped contents or thoughts or whatever they are, mm -hmm. then there's this, uh, this other question about like, could you destroy right. a conscious being mm -hmm. by scattering their thoughts, by scattering mm -hmm. their images, by scattering my thoughts? Could I destroy you by scattering my thoughts? Mm -hmm. Or if somebody mm -hmm. kicks a, a sandcastle, if you can't be constructed out of the grains of that sandcastle, then I don't think you could be destroyed by the blowing of that sandcastle down. Mm -hmm. So I draw this out and I, and I try to, to do this carefully because there's distinctions that have to be made, mm -hmm. to make this careful. But I end up making an argument um, from, I would say, reason and observation, observation together with analysis, mm -hmm. that um, that there's there's both a challenge of constructing you out of mindless things, mindless forms of matter, as well as um, destroying you. It, it mm -hmm. would be kind of like going back to that ocean metaphor again. It'd be kind of like if you wanted to make an ocean out of ocean waves. There's a construction problem, actually, because it turns out the ocean is prior to the ocean waves. Mm -hmm. OK, well, what if you wanted to destroy the ocean by scattering the ocean waves? Mm -hmm. That's not going to work either for the same reason mm -hmm. um, that the ocean is actually prior to the waves. Um, so so I end up making this argument that you are in a significant sense uh, prior to the contents within your field of, of consciousness, whether they yeah. are thoughts, images, even shape things, um, and that you can't be created or destroyed just by reconfiguring uh, material parts. Right, this, right. This, this does, does give me a reason. I, I was going to say it convinces me. That is honest. It does convince me. Um, it's just an independent reason to think that worldview aside, when I say worldview aside, I, I mean, you know, theism aside, mindless first uh, aside, um, 
I'm, I, I'm going to continue to survive. In fact, I've got a paper in the works with another philosopher named Andrew Bailey. Oh, yeah, you've done good work with him before. And a working yeah. title. Yeah, he's a great co-author to work with. Mm-hmm. One, one of our uh, a working title is, if you can survive a day, you can survive death. Oh, that's that's a cool title. <laughs> and it's going to make use of this idea. It's like, if, if you can actually survive a day, then that's all we need to highlight the principles of continuation. Because um, all, all that changes are material forms, but you continue, you'll, you'll survive the scattering of, of your molecules. And, yeah. and this does take that technical analysis to really draw that out. Yeah, that, I mean, it's so cool. And, and um, you know, this is one of those things there, maybe you can see, well, does it pick up any confirmation anywhere? And I, I don't want to go too much back into the NDE stuff, but that was something, and I really try to emphasize this with people, you know, years and years ago, you would have told me about the NDE stuff, and I would have been like, bunch of hooey um i'm sure there's nothing there but then when you really dive into the research around it the peer-reviewed research uh you start to realize oh wow there's something really interesting going on here you know yeah. and, and i don't rest of... any of it on that i mean for right. me all of my published work makes use of reason observations that everybody can access but i do think that the nde reports that i've looked at i've looked at a lot wide range yeah. of them um correlate very well with this yeah or at least they kind of might give you a little confirmatory support of this thesis right yeah really good okay so you wanted to say we wanted to touch on on causal exclusion you know ai is a big thing right now right uh i'm sure you have some thoughts on it do we want to swerve into that at all a little bit we can definitely wrap that in because you know ai a lot of that has to do with machine learning right uh exploring functional complexity yeah there's always this further question whether if you can get the android to act like it's intelligent, to act like it's um, actually consciously from the first person perspective, Mm -hmm. having thoughts, feeling love for you. You know, chat GPT, I've been having correspondence with chat GPT now. We get into philosophy debates sometimes. (laughs) Yeah, I saw that on Twitter, that's pretty funny. (laughs) Yeah, Um, well now it doesn't even claim to be conscious, it actually claims not to be conscious. Maybe it's wrong about that, right? You know, maybe it's generated some kind of self-awareness. Um, but, but I do think that the AI is very interesting because kind of my big picture thought about the AI is that I, I, I don't think that mere rearrangement of function is going to be enough yeah. to explain the sort of qualitative first person experiential aspects of consciousness. Right. However, I do recognize that there are ways in which um, human beings could interact to cause opportunities for new conscious forms to emerge, like babies, for example, right? Okay? Mm-hmm. And so um, this does open up theoretical space for the idea that um, it kind of, in, in my view, that prior existing conscious beings could, through some kind of artificial mechanism, come into new forms through yeah. AI. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But the, the consciousness has to already be there. Uh, in, yeah. In my view. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting. And I've yeah, obviously thought about about this, too. And I agree if you just take a sort of, I guess, mechanistic view of things, then I'm, I'm totally with you. Right. It seems like we face these construction problems and really we have imposed something of, of an image of ourselves onto computers and forgot that we did that and then reimposed it back on ourselves. I know that's David mm-hmm. Hitley Hart's way of, of thinking about, right. Yeah. The, the yeah. semantic, you know, syntactic backdrop is all on our side. Right. Right. Yeah. Not on, not on the machine. Right. This is something of a, of an illusion. If yeah, we like project that, our mind into the machine. Yeah. That's it. Right. Yeah. If you, yeah. Um, if you think that, you know, the world is sort of that way, but maybe you don't like, like maybe, <laughs> Like say you're just an Aristotelian, right? And that that forms are given when certain conditions are met. Yeah. Well, maybe a certain condition could be met, and then a form is is given. So I don't I don't That's see it. I don't yeah. see how there you go. I, I I don't see how AI could settle the dispute one way or another. I guess is what. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. M- mere analysis of, of functional distinctions, I don't think it's going to settle it without these kind of deeper considerations. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So we're, we're on the same page there. Okay. Sorry. Let's go back to the other thing you wanted. Well, to this talk fits about. so beautifully yeah. actually mm-hmm. with the causal exclusion um, it's, it, and the destruction problem also fits with the causal exclusion because causal exclusion is about one way to put it is it's, it's about how deeply we fit into reality. Yeah. How, how deep are we in to the mm-hmm. world? Uh, if, if I form an intention in my mind, to generate a purple image Mm -hmm. okay it's hard to do this without closing my eyes but yeah you know sometimes i'll do these experiments like what kind of power do i have 
mm-hmm. the physics of my own conscious self. One thing I've noticed, Pat, is if I can get an image to rotate, mm-hmm. it'll keep rotating without me continuing to apply the same intention. Mm-hmm. It'll keep rotating until I apply a new intention to get it to stop rotating and go the other way. Yeah, I'm testing it right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If you can get it, if you can get it to rotate, it'll just kind of automatically keep, or if you can get something to bounce, it'll kind of yeah. continue mm-hmm. to bounce. Yeah, there it goes. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's great. So, I love it's, these experiences. <laughs> no, no. So it's interesting because to me, yeah. this this is data, um, first right. person data about my intentions and then mm-hmm. correlated with images that seem to correspond with the informational content of the intention. So the informational content would be like what I'm telling the image to do. I want it to rotate to the right. You know, mm-hmm. I'm intending for it to do that. I want it to go to the left, begins to go to the left. Um, I can lift my, my, my finger, you know, there's some, some correlation there. Right. And obviously it's, it's mediated through neurons and machinery of, of my brain. Okay. That's, that's also very, very evident here, but there's this, this kind of, I want to say more fundamental question about how Jaguar Kim asks this question. He's kind of famous for raising this exclusion problem, how it is that your, your intention can correlate with these very specific effects, okay? If everything is actually explained already by the mindless marching. Bot- bottom up, right. The like, bottom up material events. And that is, I want people to appreciate that. That is an amazing thing. You know, if it's all the mindless bits, bottom yeah. up, that you actually it, seem to form this intention to spin a blue square in your mind. And then that's what happens. It's what happens. Yeah. So, so I've been thinking about a metaphor to help, help with this. Yeah, please help us. Cause this is a profound point that I think could be it's easily so missed. It's so profound. Right? Yeah. It's, mm-hmm. it's often missed. And mm-hmm. I've read some very technical work on Kim's argument mm-hmm. and all these distinctions get made, but the problem resurfaces in new forms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, people talk about parts and holes and they, they, they talk about different kinds of causation, causal relevance versus causal efficacy it gets mm-hmm. very technical as you can imagine but I, I think part of the technicality uh, that's been spawned out of this discussion and i feel like this is one of these sort of behind the scenes uh discussions that are sort of explodes in the background yep people hear about the hard problem they don't hear as much about causal exclusion problem or, or right. they think well we already know this through science or something uh we already understand that right but this is getting into the science and it's talking about different models to explain it in ways that don't lead to these technical traps. Mm-hmm. And, and I really do think that the richness of the literature that grows out of this um, is a signal of, of the significance of the problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so just kind of illustrate this, imagine you have some marbles in like a box and the marbles are just rolling around and these represent mindless grains of reality. You could think of them as mindless atoms or mindless fields. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter how you think about it, but these marbles are not themselves directed by any kind of intelligence or intention. There's no intention mm-hmm. that tells Marvel what to do. And imagine that everything else that exists is explained in terms of these marbles, right. everything else that happens. Now you're watching the box and let's see, there's different ways we could do that. Let's, let's go like this. Let's say that you form, you witness yourself forming an intention in your mind, form a smiley face. And then the marbles mm-hmm. form into a smiley face. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a little bit strange. Now, you could say maybe what's going on there is that those marbles are connected to some forces that are causing you to form the intention, form a smiley face. When those marbles would independently, by randomly knocking into each other, form that smiley face. That's a way of maintaining the sort of bottom-up, mindless first account. The the marbles explain both the formation of their own smiley face, as well as your intention Mm -hmm. that they form that, that smiley face. Okay. Um, But there's a difficulty with that explanation is that what, what that does is it it causes excludes the role of the intention to actually make any kind of difference. Mm -hmm. And there's a simpler explanation of what's going on, which is that it's not the mindless marbles are generating everything. It's that your intention actually can make a causal difference somehow. Yeah. Maybe it's mm-hmm. mystery how that works, but there's evidence that it's, it's, it's happening. 
Now I use the example of an, an intention and that's already to bleed mind into my analogy. So just to, if I can give one more um, analogy, imagine you observe the wind pickup and the wind causes, as you observe and feel the wind, you, you witness the marbles move to the side of the box. Mm -hmm. To me, that's evidence that the wind is causally contributing to the marbles. And it's not that the wind was caused by the marbles. Mm -hmm. right? It's that the wind is actually making a difference to the marbles. Yes. Mm -hmm. But see, what Kim is saying is that if we say that instead, the marbles, the mindless bits, do everything fundamentally and everything else is explained after that, that causally excludes any other uh, influences, whether mm -hmm. from wind, uh, well, now back to the application, or from mind. Yeah. You're not really making any difference. When you're rotating those images, it's not really from the intention that you mm -hmm. witness first person. And this has led to just a uh, minefield of, of analyses. Mm -hmm. and, and if I could just share a story of um, Frank Jackson and his intellectual journey, mm -hmm. thinking about this, because I think it illustrates how real philosophers are grappling with this. This isn't just like me with a predestined conclusion, <laughs> right. just trying to marshal the evidence to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that worry comes up and, and I appreciate that worry a lot. And it's an important worry. But there are philosophers who they're not starting with a predestined conclusion. They're trying to figure out how does your mind make a difference in the world? So Frank Jackson, his story is so interesting, Pat, because many people know him for the person who talks about the Mary argument, the, the argument that Mary, the neuroscientist, is colorblind. And she knows about brains through black and white sort of vision of mm -hmm. what it, what those brains do when they're seeing in color, when the people with those brains see in color. Then one day, Mary learns what it's like experientially to see in color. She's no longer colorblind. Yep. And Frank Jackson's argument is that it looks like she's learning something new, something about the experience of mm -hmm. seeing in color for the first time. Mm -hmm. That information wasn't recorded in the black and white information about mere function. Right. About mere patterns. Right. So people debate that. Right. They debate whether he learned something new. But see, this is just it gets so fascinating. So Frank Jackson, he's thinking that therefore mentality doesn't just reduce down to the patterns of, of neurons firing. There's something else. So this is called it's a form of dualism. You call this property dualism. Mm -hmm. But Frank Jackson was also persuaded by this causal exclusion problem. So he talks about how in those days, he thought the mind was a kind of causally inert epiphenomena yep. of brain activity. Mm -hmm. The intention isn't making a difference to mm -hmm. brain activity. Later in his career, he, he changes his mind on this. I, I saw him in, in an interview talk about this. I thought this is just so fascinating because he got more convinced that his mind does make a difference, that <laughs> his mind do make a difference, okay? uh, that that then he thought, well, there's got to be something wrong then with, with my other argument mm. that there's a distinction because here, and here's why, if you can reduce mentality to the underlying physicality, then you could arguably restore the causal impact of the, of the underlying physicality. Uh, because then, and I say arguably, because I actually don't think this works in the end. I think you still have a problem of parts and holes. So that mm. even if you have a macro a brain state, but the micro brain states are pulling the strings. The macro brain state becomes a, a puppet of the micro. Yeah, sure. And, mm -hmm. and I talk about this in, in my puppet chapter on, mm -hmm. on how you have the power to choose. So I, I, I think for technical reasons, even reducing mentality to the, to the physical is not going to just by itself solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But there, there are ways in which you could have a reduction and it's going to maybe alleviate this causal exclusion problem, mm -hmm. at least on some paths. So he, in his interview, he talks about this kind of um, conflict in his own mind. Now, he still thought his original argument was pretty good, but he had to like rethink it. So he did. He, he re rethought the original argument and he, he, he um, has a new analysis of the knowledge argument. Mm -hmm. So even though, you know, he was the endorser of the argument originally, he's got a new analysis. I still think it's, it's a great argument. That original argument is yeah. a great argument. Mm -hmm. um, but this is just showing what, philosophers are trying to do, they're trying to grapple with, okay, how, how can we account for the reality of mind, the reality of our intentions as, as they appear to us in first person experience, 
-hmm. while also seeing how mind can make a difference in the material world, while also having a mindless first frame of reality. Yes. See, I think the problem for Jackson is that he's still operating out of that mindless first. I think if you flip the frame, right. And if you have the mind first, if we're actually deeper in, mm -hmm. we're, we're deeper in even, even into the material world. So it, it's a kind of bottom up um, causation. You, you form an intention to love somebody yeah. that creates ripple effects in, in energy fields mm -hmm. that ripple up into, uh, to your brain. Yes. And evidence for this is direct. You see, people say, oh, well, you know, this is on the fringe of science or something like this. There are interesting scientific articles right. about quantum brain theory and how this might work. I actually wanted that to go, I wanted to go there a little bit because I think yeah. if people are not just, um, I don't want to come this to come off the wrong way, but assuming a very outdated mechanistic picture of science, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's they developments might, in science. There, but science is, it really has developed and there's some really interesting stuff in the sciences that seems to give a lot of support to what you're talking about josh maybe you could just spend a little bit of time talking about some of that i mean even just yeah. the neuroplasticity is i know extremely fascinating for yeah. example right yeah mm -hmm. well and it, it's i i find myself like ex i experience a dilemma when sort of the empirical science comes up because the, the dilemma is this science um carries a kind of authority uh, mm -hmm. so you know if i can talk about the the science that can maybe contribute to maybe the, a weight of, of what I want to share. Okay. Um, but I actually think that the first hand analysis through logic and observation mm -hmm. is even clearer and even stronger that you can Certainly. witness yourself mm -hmm. moving those images. And then through analysis that somehow you have mental power yeah. to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And that, that I, I, I think the power of that can get missed sometimes if you go into the weeds of the science too quickly. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, this is why I say it's a dilemma. If I don't go into the science, then it can almost sound like, oh, I'm one of those metaphysicians who go into the, those meadows of metaphysics, <laughs> unwilling to sort of tether my web of ideas right, to right. concrete observations. Yeah. And so there's almost like a, a lose-lose scenario there. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I fortunate, but up. yeah. Uh -huh. But on the, on the other hand, I think there is actually an abundance of riches that both the analysis and the emerging science both mm -hmm. are converging. And, and I've been... Mm -hmm kind of seeing this from many different fields, neurobiology, neuroscience, cognitive science, all, also cosmology and physics, just reading. Now, now here I'm, I'm reading as, as a lay person, in, in a sense, I'm not in those fields, but I'm reading what the experts in those fields are reporting. I'm reading their, their data sets. Mm -hmm. And what you mentioned about you know, neuroplasticity is, is one of those as well, um, that this is mainstream. This is not sort of fringe science. I, I think the challenge is how do we analyze this? How do mm -hmm. we analyze the evidence for the effects that thinking, having mindful intentions um, have on the structures of, of our brains? I mean, yeah. I, I was reading a study where um, people with knee injuries, they uh, had a control group where they formed an intention, just a healing intention towards their knee. And they had another group uh, where they didn't form that intention. And they found a statistically significant improvement from those who just form the intention in their minds, you know, towards their knee. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of studies like this where, you know, your, your actual intentions make a difference. Mm -hmm. I think some of the worry is people can kind of blow this out of proportion and say, oh, it's, it's all just intention. It's right. all just mine. You know, it doesn't matter any matter doesn't any matter at all. Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, and I think that kind of leads to, you know, that kind of exaggeration, I think rightly inspires skepticism. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but there's a lot of interesting work being done. I mean, I, I've been reading, there was a study about people getting sick and my, that people's mental health affected the uh, rates of them getting sick with a, with a control group. And they gave some kind of virus, not, not a lethal virus, but mm -hmm. you know, if some yeah. kind of virus, and then how would that affect their body? And they saw clear patterns that there are certain mental habits that actually create uh, shields and protections for you. It's not hundred yeah. percent, right? But it does make a difference. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the um, that's really good. I'm trying to figure out where I want to pick up on it. Um, these aren't, I guess, these aren't just Morian facts for you, right, Josh? Um, right. But it, no. in a sense, I guess I want uh, because you do analyze it and you do give arguments for why you think it's um, 
for being a self-realist, right? Uh, but do you think it's illegitimate just to, to just to, here's a hand type of stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, if I'm honest about my personal philosophical journey, there were for me a sort of slew of Morian facts, right? That just seemed non-negotiable. And part mm -hmm. of the reason I gave up certain other, other theories, it just seemed that they were trying to get me to negotiate on these things. Mm -hmm. Myself, <laughs> my free, a lot of the things are just the things that you report, right? Yeah. Now, so that, that caused me to want to reject those theories. If I have to like eliminate these things or whatever, uh, it's a theory that's got to go, <laughs> not the, not these things. Right. Then, then, and that, that was, that's my honest procedure. That's sort of what I did. Now, later I came to realize, oh, you know, I think I could give some more support to these mm -hmm. Morian facts, but for me, they were actually Morian facts at the time, if I'm being honest, yeah. like they were just this obvious truths, you know, I've got hands. Yeah. Right. Um, I exist. My yeah. intentions make a difference, <laughs> right? Uh -huh. Yeah, I am morally culpable for some things that mm -hmm. I've done. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. stuff, stuff like that just seem so obvious. Uh, but I get that, that why that would be unsatisfying to people. And I don't even know if I have a question for you, Josh. Is well, I want to I want to relate right? to that because mm -hmm. I feel like maybe I'm a bit unusual in this way, but I I feel like I have these just skeptics instincts. Um, and, and people might not feel this way about me because I'm often trying to build a bridge almost like out of the pit of, of skepticism. But I love to go into those pits of skepticism. I, I just get drawn in. I mean, if, yep. if somebody's like, oh, I, I don't think you actually have thoughts. And I had somebody on Twitter say it was it was absurd. No, no. The word was nonsense to think that there was aboutness. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's nonsense. So so I want to I get drawn into that. I, I do not just it's just my personality like i do not even like to just say well no i mean it's nonsense to say that that's nonsense I, for mm -hmm. me i just like get sucked into those pits yep. and, and I, I feel like feel like maybe it's kind of part of something that makes me alive inside if i can mm -hmm. go deep into those pits of skepticism and then say hey you know what actually here's a set of rocks and if you step along here you can get out of that pit of skepticism yes and see something over here yeah or sometimes it happens that this pit of skepticism is really important because there are these structures of claimed knowledge that are just, they're fool's gold. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I don't want people living in, in these, these structures that are just sort of tricks. So I, I just, I have such like a, almost like just a heart for um, anybody who is kind of plagued by these questions and resists kind of overconfident assumptions kind of picked up. The worry is it's kind of maybe it's picked up from culture, you know, culture. Sure. Mm -hmm. it, it feels obvious that we have hands, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's because our culture, you know, you know, that sort of a thing. And and to be honest, like, I feel like it gives me a kind of excitement and even a, uh, a reassurance. If I can go yeah. into those bits of skepticism and say, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess that structure was too simple. Oh, but actually this skepticism is, is unnecessary. In fact, mm -hmm. it's self-defeating. Uh, we can sort of, I, I think we can see that. Yes. Yeah, I agree with you. I've I've been in those pits uh, many times before, and uh, they're not always fun, but there's a lot of fruit that can come out of, yeah. of being in them. I was just kind of reporting that, that for me, that actually came a little bit later, if I'm being yeah, honest. Yeah, I felt you know, that. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And it's important to be honest, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're right. I think that that is that the fact that I did turn back and re-examine those things that to me were just that just seems so obvious, right? Was a very fruitful uh, part of my journey and helped illumine other things, right? Rather yeah. than just sort of leaving them as mere well, subjects. If, if I could just add, add one more note on this, is, um, Peter Unger in his early work at Philosopher, um, he has a, a paper on whether he exists. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's really questioning that. And, and I think that actually by going into that question for him, it helped him later in his career to write a book about why in fact he does exist and if he exists, then reality is not just fundamentally mindless physics. Yeah. And so he makes that argument. And, and I think he came to that argument through really wrestling with that question. Like, I think I exist, but like, how do I know if I exist? <laughs> you know, how do I really know that? Especially because in the article, he was kind of drawing out an inference that the sort of mindless grains of physics don't seem to account for his, his existence. That, that's right. the self-realism. Yeah. And then you can flip it around. It's like, okay, well now there's a deeper insight can actually appreciate why something as familiar as my own existence says something about the kind of world we're in something mm. deep and profound.
that's where I get excited. Yeah. And I can tell because that enthusiasm comes through in your book. And for those who are wondering, the answer is yes. Josh does examine and defend all this in his book and it's wonderful. Josh, is there anything else that you want to touch on? I could chat with you all day, but I want to respect your time as well. Otherwise I want to make sure we talk a little bit more about your book and encourage yeah, no, people thank to you. Grab it. Um, yeah. I think that that's it. You know, we, we covered the, the topics, um, you know, just thinking about that destruction problem, which grows out of the construction problem of, of creating a being like you and then how that correlates very well with this kind of causal exclusion problem that for there to be a being like you that's able to make a difference in the world through intentions there's a way in which you have to fit deeply into the world you know you can't just be a sort of byproduct blowing in the wind when the marble can't, can't be late and local right yeah yeah that's it yeah got to got to be early and deep yeah maybe, i like that maybe even non-local <laughs> i like that yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. okay your new book it is soon uh, to be released. So please remind us of the title. And of course, I'm going to give my uh, most enthusiastic endorsement that people grab this. It is a wonderful book. It is deep, yet accessible, which again, I just had to say I was so impressed because I know some of the arguments you present, they have a lot of technicalities. And honestly, yeah, you were kind of you and thinkers like Mortimer Adler were inspirations for me of trying to hit that that balance, you know, yeah. that it's almost impossible to hit, right? Of like not wanting to leave anything important out, but at the same time, making sure that you don't put people into a deep sleep, you know, two yeah. pages no, in. You, you definitely do that, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the pieces of your book coming out, um, you you do strike that balance. There's a depth to it and then a clarity. Uh, that That's a that's a rare thing. Well, thank yeah. you. You've been a, you've been a model for me. So tell us a little bit more about the book, Josh. Uh, may, can we give some more highlights? What what other things do you cover in the book that we didn't mention just to tease it? And then where's the best place for people to grab a copy? Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's Who Are You Really? A Philosopher's Investigation into the Nature and Origin of Persons. And one of the things I really try to do in that book is to give the reader the power to illuminate this, I call it the cave of, of consciousness, mm -hmm. to sort of illuminate it and by their own lights. So I model my journey through the cave and I, I offer my observations. But in the end, I really do want readers from a wide variety of perspectives to come from reading the book with almost like just seeing their own powers to see more about who they are and how they fit into the world. And so I, I guess maybe that would be sort of a highlight that I, I would say, you know, kind of is a theme throughout the book. And it's one of those things I, I mentioned that it's been an obsession. And so even though now it's published and out there, I have new thoughts, um, new sort of writing ideas, things I want to bring forward that continue to build from this. I think one of the things that I've come to appreciate is just how every theory has a sort of complex range of sub theories and a kind of wide semantic range so that if you talk about one theory and you try to analyze it, there's going to be somebody who endorses that theory who's going to maybe have a little bit of a different take on mm. that theory. And I think that's kind of really important um, to kind of recognize that. It's something I, I, I do try to do very much in, in the book, but it's something that I feel like I've maybe even widened uh, that appreciation even more since, since writing the book. If there's just these ranges of, of on the theories, which also I think is, is why I try to get to the more basic concepts not getting stuck in whether materialism is true or not true. And in fact, toward the end, I give a theory of what I call mindful matter, which is a materialistic theory that's consistent with my core conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so I, I offer that, you know, to, to kind of widen that net for people. Uh, and that's connected with recent work, you know, in, in physics and as well as applying some analysis to that recent work. So it's, it's kind of taking data from scientists and then um, showing how that data fits really, really well with something that we can independently confirm and check right. uh, through, through these tools. Hmm. Yeah, so you know the book is uh, forthcoming March 20. You can get it on- uh, Yeah, four days from now, wow. Yeah, hmm. so it'll be coming out here. Just Google it, it'll show up. <laughs> get it out, you know, anywhere, I believe. So yeah, get it, people. It's amazing. I know. I know a lot of people listening to this will have already read your uh, your previous book, and I'm and I and yeah. I'm sure they loved it. So you're gonna love this one, uh, Josh. Uh, it is always a great pleasure chatting with you. Is there anything else you want to mention? Anything new on the website, or any other new projects, or how people can just keep up with you in general? Well, just thanks to you because it occurs to me you you devoured one of my early drafts, 
And then you offered me, you know, a set of, of comments and sources. And a, a number of people had, had done that, provided some input. But you offered probably some of the most um, comments. And, and that was very helpful to me, you know, in, in developing the book, too. So I wanted just to mention that. And other than that, yeah, just thank you for having me on. I, I feel like talking about these topics that are just so interesting to me mm -hmm. that can affect lives across all perspectives and all domains. I mean, look, even angels are curious about these things. Even they're wondering, how do we get here? Right. Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is all relevant to every being on every planet. So thank you for the, the honor to talk about these things. Yeah, you. thank you. And thank uh, everybody who's tuned in. Sorry, we're getting it towards the end of our time here. So we got to close this out, but keep the conversation. You know what? Here, off the cuff, here's what we're going to do. Uh, keep the conversation going afterwards. Drop some comments and thoughts, whatever you want to leave. I'm going to get an extra copy of Josh's book for a giveaway, and I'll pick somebody at random once it comes out. It's the least I can do. So uh, if you want a chance to win that, just any thoughts you have, love to hear them. But you have to do it after the stream once the video is posted, and it'll make that happen for you guys. All right. Thank you all very much, and we'll see you next time.